first of all, my name is Paul Gunter. I'm director of the Reactor Oversight Project at uh, Beyond Nuclear. Um, Beyond Nuclear has only been around since 2007, but I uh, worked for 16 years with a group called Nuclear Information and, and Resource Service in Washington. And before that, I was um, involved with a group called the Clamshell Alliance in uh, New England. Uh, we started out in 1975, basically organizing around a construction project for two uh, Westinghouse pressurized water reactors uh, that were proposed uh, for a saltwater estuary um, on the New Hampshire seacoast. And uh, we set about through a process of public education, um, nonviolent direct action, uh, taking lessons from uh, Martin Luther King, Mohandas Gandhi, uh, the suffragettes movement uh, on how important citizen involvement, citizen participation, participatory democracy, this is how change happens. Um, every major change begins with the public becoming aware, becoming active, and using the principles that we have in democracy uh, to, to, make, to make change. And the nuclear issue is no different. And uh, it, uh, these, as we know, are, are often long struggles. And in fact, I often uh, quip half, half kiddingly that uh, I'll have to reincarnate uh, in, to address this issue. Uh, in more particularly, if you understand that the issue of nuclear power, um, the electricity is only a fleeting byproduct. The legacy is millions of years of nuclear waste for which there will be no benefit to any of the succeeding generations. Only this liability of building barriers within barriers within barriers over decades, over centuries, to contain the hellish byproduct of, of, uh, of nuclear power. The, the, and, and, and that, you know, basically, needs to be put into this context that uranium, in fact, is the currency of a coin whose flip sides are nuclear weapons and nuclear power, nuclear waste. So we, we need to keep in our, our vision that it's, it's more than just the nuclear power issue, but we're now faced with a... Um, uh, the spread of this technology um, means the spread of nuclear weapons as well. So the, the context that we work in at Beyond Nuclear is to address uh, both the need uh, to uh, abandon nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And, and that this is a matter of planetary survival. So the message that I want to bring you tonight um, in the short time that we have to share together is that Fukushima has basically changed the landscape of the nuclear issue. And what it, what it raises is really the issue of not only the danger of, of nuclear power itself, but when the profit motive is lost on this industry is really when our problems begin. We can, we can begin to address the need to shut down nuclear power plants, but that's only the beginning. The, the deeper problem is that this whole environmental dilemma is, is captured. Uh, by um, a corporate infrastructure, corporate power that really began at Hanford with the production of the nuclear weapons. So we're, you know, you're right here at the birthplace of, of something fiendish that has a, that will have consequence even beyond its perpetrators. And that it is such 
a strong presence that it even manages to capture entire governments. And um, you know, we've, we've seen this most clearly in this opening slide. I mean, the, here we have the five commissioners of the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, William Magwood, Christine Savinke, Allison McFarlane, George Apostolakis, and uh, William Ostendorf. And I'm sure they're all people of integrity. But they are part and parcel of a, a sy systematic and systemic capture that goes even beyond the boundaries of the United States. It's a global industry now. It's, it's a global process. And it has consequences. And, and, and we've known, I've known since 1978, actually, was when I first became aware of the issue of um, a catastrophe waiting to happen. We were, um, um, I, I was involved uh, in the process of organizing around the Seabrook Nuclear Power Construction Project. We were faced with a more imminent threat from an operating nuclear reactor that had just began in 1972. And it was a General Electric Mark I boiling water reactor in Vernon, Vermont, just across the uh, Connecticut River from where I lived in New Hampshire. And we were aware that the, um, this was a bad design, fundamentally flawed. And, uh, and that awareness really grew uh, over several decades. And when I got a call from uh, CNN on March 11th, 2011, they asked me to come in and comment on camera for uh, the, uh, the situation room with Wolf Blitzer um, that was occurred, this accident had occurred in Japan as a result of the earthquake and the tsunami that we were, that we were all aware of, but something was now awry at the nuclear power plant at Fukushima Daiichi. There were high radiation readings around the, uh, the perimeter of the facility. And they asked me to come in and um, within a 10 minute conversation, the, uh, the journalist, uh, Jean Meserve, who, by the way, was the sister of um, Richard Meserve, who was a former commissioner of the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So here I am being interviewed by Richard Meserve's sister on a nuclear accident that was occurring in Japan. And she asked me, what's just very simply, what is your concern? <laughs> and I said, well, our concern is that this reactor could literally blow, the, blow its roof. And uh, in fact, uh, that's what we saw the next day. It was, it was just you know, a matter of, of hours uh, when um, the, um, what was occurring while we were on camera was fuel damage at the Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi facility. Um, and in the process of that fuel damage in the core, um, were, there was this liberation of hydrogen gas from the intense heat and electrolysis and the, uh, the interaction between a, uh, the zircaloy element that makes up all the fuel in these reactors. And, and you should understand that zirconium, which is the, the, it's a very strong alloy that is a, f a very effective heat transfer element so that when you heat uranium, uh, enriched uranium through, through the criticality process, it transfers heat very, very efficiently through very thin walls, but it's very strong. But if you powder zirconium, that's what goes into high explosives. That's, that's the flash powder in, in, in uh, flash bulbs. 
And when uranium interacts with zirconium, uh, in, and, and, and you get this interaction of the zirconium overheating, interacting with, uh, uh, with water, it, it separates out the elements of water into hydrogen and oxygen, and you get a very explosive environment that is looking for an ignition source. Well, um, I, I should note that uh, Anthony Petranglia, who also uh, was on uh, camera, uh, said that, well, that chance is very, very remote. And in fact, nuclear power um, has consistently relied upon this, this, uh, this premise, this assumption that the the probability of that worst case is so remote that the risk is, is well worth the taking uh, and, and the benefit. But in review of the accident, the um, Japan National Diet, which is, uh, is the um, Japan's equivalent to our Congress, their uh, Nuclear Accident Independent Investigation Commission um, quite frankly concluded that Fukushima was a man-made disaster and that it was primarily the result of, of a collusion between government regulator and Tokyo Electric Power Company. But that, that collusion is ex precisely what's going on all around, in all these, all these uh, regulatory bodies, that you have a, a system of uh, where nuclear power is promoted by government subsidy. And that, that's historically been, been the case. Um, we've known all along that uh, going back to documents, uh, going to 1952, the Atomic Energy Commission um, put out a white paper where they interviewed um, and, and had a request for proposals to groups like Monsanto, Union Carbide, Union Electric, Detroit Edison, um, Westinghouse, General Electric, and their white paper was to request and promote the idea that government was looking for partnership with, with corporations for national defense. And that in the, in the, in the, we now, the government announced that there was now this opportunity for corporations to participate in the production of plutonium and in, the, in the, the process of promoting plutonium production for nuclear weapons, they could co-generate electricity from the waste heat through nuclear power. And this was the premise in 1952. 1954, it's reframed as Atoms for Peace. And in that same era, we went from 8,000 nuclear weapons to 21,000 nuclear weapons in the United States. And uh, eventually they did build one dual purpose reactor um, that was precisely, I think even um, President John F. Kennedy uh, was at its uh, coronation. Um, but generally speaking, the nuclear power issue uh, took off on its own. Um, but that was here in Hanf at Hanford where uh, the, the dream of this, uh, of this white paper in 1952 actually took, took root. And government and industry um, you know, set forth a proposal to co-generate electricity for the purpose of plutonium production. And, and it is ever so now the threat that we see um, not only a man-made disaster 
from a mistake, but the, the overarching threat to all life on this planet from this partnership. Aside from the, the mistake, I wanted to point out that another big concern that we have for nuclear power is um, this uh, th this is basically engineering 101 here, but we have uh, what's called the bathtub curve. And essentially what it is, is whether we're talking about nuclear power plants or electric toasters, uh, you introduce a product uh, along a, um, a, uh, a time and uh, event sequence, uh, accident sequence, failure modes, and we see that when you introduce a product early on, you have a, a, a period of uh, a high rate of failure. Uh, as they work the bugs out of uh, the uh, contraption, uh, the failure rate falls off. Uh, it can be fairly steep uh, it, where you reach a useful life period. And then as components uh, wear out, as you find materials are susceptible, uh, corrosion, cracking, embrittlement. When that starts to set in, then we see the uh, event horizon increase, uh, the accident sequence increase, um, and, uh, or what's called the, uh, the wear out life. Um, we're concerned that, in fact, right now, we are probably somewhere early on in this phase out here. We've seen events already. Um, three Mile Island was only three months old when it had its, its meltdown. Um, Chernobyl was only two years old when it had its catastrophic accident. Now we're beginning to see um, other events here, uh, like the Davis-Bessie nuclear power station in uh, Ohio, where we found uh, a high rate of uh, corrosion. Can I have the next slide? Um, this uh, is a uh, literally a reactor with a hole in its head. You're looking at the Davis Bessie nuclear power station, and in um, April of 2000, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission had this picture when the um, power station was set to go back online for two more years during refueling. So this was after the refueling. The NRC inspectors received this picture and they gave a green light to the davis Bessey nuclear power station first uh, Energy Nuclear Corporation, uh, the go ahead to operate for two more, uh, two more years. Anybody looking at this picture can tell that something very, very wrong is going on at this reactor. Uh, what you're looking at, in fact, is uh, iron oxide roiling off the top of the reactor pressure vessel. Next slide. And in fact, what was going on was that um, a, um, this, this here is the, uh, the top of the reactor pressure vessel. Uh, this is uh, seven and three quarter inches of carbon steel with an inner liner of uh, three sixteenths of an inch of um, stainless steel. The stainless steel liner uh, is there to keep the corrosive borated coolant um, that's in this pressurized environment, 2,000 pounds per square inch, operating at temperatures of 600 degrees Fahrenheit, to keep that borated corrosive coolant from eating its way out. But Davis Bessey had developed a crack in um, a, um, a susceptible material, uh, Inconel 600, uh, that is used as sleeving, a pressure fitted sleeving, so the control rods can drive in and out of the reactor to control the reaction. 
and just the wear and tear um, had caused this cracking and the borated coolant under this pressure was being forced out through those cracks, hairline cracks. The steam was then, uh, it would flash to steam and the steam would condense and rain down on the top of the reactor vessel head which was again 600 degrees Fahrenheit so the water would immediately flash off leaving a puddle of boric acid. This boric acid ate through six and three quarter inches of carbon steel leaving the three sixteenths the three sixteenths inch liner now bulging from this uh, 2,000 pounds per square inch pressure so that it looked like a tire about to burst and in fact we were probably as close as uh, eight weeks depending on what the, the corrosion rate is nobody really knows but eight weeks from a major accident in Ohio from a, a pressure vessel rupture but again the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they, they had not only seen that picture, but Davis Bessey is a Babcock and Wilcox pressurized water reactor. It is, um, uh, there are seven of these reactors in the United States. Uh, Babcock and Wilcox is the model of the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant. There, are two, there were two units, uh, one melted down in 79, uh, uh, unit, um, I should say unit two melted down in 79 and unit one uh, is operational. But the NRC had known that six of the seven Babcock and Wilcox reactors had cracks in the uh, sleeving. The only one that had not been inspected was Davis Bessey. So the staff um, had, using its regulatory guidance, had formulated a draft order to shut down Davis Bessey early so that it could go through the inspections to look for those cracks. And they gave the order to the senior safety officer for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission with the Nuclear Reactor Regulation Division who took it to First Energy Corporate Headquarters and said, you know, we've got an order here to shut you down early for inspections. And the nuclear officer at First Energy Nuclear, according to the Office of the Inspector General, said, you don't shut us down. It'll, it'll, It'll hurt our profits. It'll, it'll look bad on Wall Street. We don't have fuel here to, uh, to make our refueling operation. The order was pocketed. It was never issued. And it was, it was never issued according to the Office of Inspector General because according to their investigation, it appears that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission needs absolute proof before it will shut down a nuclear power plant early. We've also seen um, the whole issue of regulatory capture uh, in, in what we've termed a revolving door between industry and regulator. Again, this is part of the concern, I, I, you know, we hearken back to the warning of the national diet in Japan. Collusion of government, regulator, and industry was the cause of the accident at Fukushima. Here we see former NRC chairman Dale Klein. In this picture, Dale Klein is now chairing the TEPCO Reform Committee in Japan. So he goes from U.S. nuclear regulator to TEPCO promoter. And he wants to restore. But, you know, we had known, we had had concerns about the 
NRC under decline through um, as early as uh, January of uh, 2007 when uh, Chairman Klein in addressing concerns about the vulnerability of all, every U.S. nuclear power plant to aircraft uh, crash or, or attack even more specifically. Concerns were assuaged by Chairman Klein by saying nuclear power plants are inherently robust structures that our studies show provide adequate protection in a hypothetical attack by an airplane. No problem. Don't worry. Sit down. Be quiet. Go to work. Mind your business. We got you covered. What he did not tell you was one of those studies was done by Argonne National Lab specifically on U.S. nuclear power plants in their evaluation of aircraft hazard analysis for nuclear power plants, September 9, 1982. This is while CGN is being constructed. It appears that for all U.S. plants currently under construction, it has been found that it is not necessary to require containments designed to take the impact of a large commercial jet aircraft. A complete contradiction from what Chairman Klein told the American public in the days, weeks, years following the ever apparent threat of our enemies, those who would do us harm knowing that nuclear power plants are vulnerable. If you read the 9-11 Commission, if you've read the 9-11 Commission report, Al-Qaeda's original plan was to hijack 10 aircraft and direct two of them into U.S. nuclear facilities. One of those uh, was a, um, a, uh, a, 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 tr a flight training exercise that Mohammed Atta took over Indian Point, just 25 miles from New York City, where they viewed the, uh, the vulnerability of using nuclear power plants to enhance their attack. And yet, the American people have been lied to, not to protect us, but to protect the production agenda and the financial agenda of the nuclear industry. Well. This brings us to our story tonight of collusion of government, regulator, and industry to protect not the American people, not the environment, but the financial and production agenda of this industry. What you're looking at here on the slide to the left is the Oyster Creek nuclear power plant in Toms River, New Jersey. It is the original Fukushima Daiichi. It was the first General Electric Mark I boiling water reactor, a 600 megawatt reactor commissioned in uh, October of 1969, uh, 60 miles from New York. Um, this was the, um, the first Mark I, uh, the Mark I that was eventually to be used as a pattern for Fukushima Daiichi. And uh, following the accident, the uh, U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in an effort to whitewash the consequence of operating dangerous, dated, aging, flawed nuclear power plants put together a set of recommendations, as you will note, for enhancing radio reactor safety in the 21st century. Clearly, the agenda here is to continue operation. And in fact, what we've known is that in 19... 72, just a few years after Oyster Creek was commissioned, the chief safety officer 
uh, within the Atomic Energy Commission, the predecessor of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in a, a memorandum to his colleagues on September 25, 1972, warned that the Mark I boiling water reactor should be discontinued. They, they should not be operated. They should no longer license the Mark I reactor, primarily because the containment structure, the all-important last barrier for public health and safety and the environment was too small. And, and what you see here is um, sort of a, a, a couple of schematics of what the GE boiling water reactor technology relies upon um, is a, uh, a containment design large diameter donut 18 feet in diameter, million gallons of water and uh, then uh, a, a bulbous s uh, steel structure in which the reactor vessel fits and, and this is the, cr the containment structure that's credited as the barrier to catastrophe. And it, it, in principle, if there is a severe accident, if there is an overheating of the reactor fuel, uh, overpressure, you know, lots of steam, they got to deal with it, too much heat, they dump it into this dry well, as it's called, and then through 10 large diameter pipes, the heat and the steam and the pressure is driven under this million gallons of water through these downcomers, as they're called, and the, st and the steam and the pressure and the heat are supposed to be quenched in that, in that, in that, that donut. And um, I'll just point out that the three engineers who were some of the principals that designed this, Dale Hubbard, uh, Richard um, Miner, and, and um, Dale Brittenbaugh, publicly resigned their GE managerial positions in, in, before Congress in 1976 saying this won't work. And they were ignored. And, um, but their warning followed the warning of uh, Stephen Anauer, who was the uh, AEC uh, safety officer. And what they all pointed out is that these GEBWRs, this all-important containment system for this particular design is one-sixth the volume of the containment that you typically see in these large pressurized water reactors like, like, like Seabrook or like uh, Three Mile Island. But we know, we, we have known for decades that if this system is challenged under severe accident, it will fail. And, and when I was in front of CNN, that camera on March 11th, this, is, this was just history. I was just recounting history, not my concern. We've been, we've been warned. We've been warned many times by different people, by the AEC. I'll add that in 1986, the chief safety officer with the NRC, Harold Denton, told us there's a 90% chance of failure of this containment design if challenged by a severe accident. How, how many warnings do we get? Japan has run out. In fact, um, one of the recommendations, well, I, I should add that uh, following Harold Denton's uh, warning, the um, NRC 
took the threat somewhat seriously. And the NRC in 1989 went to the operators of these 24 Mark I boiling water reactors in the United States and requested that they install a vent on containment. They requested that the operators install a vent line. Uh, eight inch, here's, this is, um, what you see here is a schematic of a vent system that is routinely used in every boiling water reactor like C, uh, uh, Columbia. Well, no, let me, no, no, let me finish. This schematic down here is what is in every boiling water reactor. And it is used to purge containment, to get in here for refueling, to get in here for routine, operate, uh, to routine maintenance and surveillance. So, um, and it goes through what they call the standby gas treatment, which is a, a charcoal bed radiation filtration system. So when they purge containment for routine operations, it gets filtered and then it goes out a 300 foot stack. The problem is, is that the containment is unreliable, which we've established. And the, the service vent is not capable of managing high pressure, high steam, hydrogen gas, radiation. And so in 1989, the NRC sent out a request that in order to provide a management strategy for a nuclear accident in one of these reactors, that you bypass this ductwork and you put a hardened vent line, an eight inch steel line that bypasses the bottleneck and then comes directly out to the stack. So there's, there's a control room operated valve that gives the operators the opportunity to defeat containment temporarily to relieve the pressure and, the, and vent the hydrogen gas, it goes to a 30 PSI rupture disc, that's tire pressure. That rupture disc and the valve then provide an, a, a, a direct line from the containment to the environment. I mean, this makes about as much sense as screen doors on a submarine. You know, they have completely defeated the idea. They, they should have removed the word containment because it no longer serves as a containment. This we saw at Fukushima Daiichi. This was installed uh, in 1992 at all six units by TEPCO to service the plant in the event of a severe accident. And with the total power failure, this vent would not open. The radiation was too high for workers to get in here to manually open. And hydrogen gas, at this point, hydrogen gas is, has lifted the top of this component off, off its screws. And hydrogen gas is now getting into the reactor building where in many cases, it, you know, in all cases, it found ignition points. And we saw the detonations that we've been warned about since 1972 and have been completely ignored. So we have an unreliable fix for unreliable containments. 
And this is, this is the result of a production agenda that is so focused on its own self-interest that we have the tremendous amount of land contamination uh, in Japan. I was just there in December of last year and uh, I can tell you that the cleanup operations, the Japanese have a word for it, for cleanup. They call it transcontamination. This is the Japanese, this is the interpretation of what the Japanese understand now. There is no cleanup. You just contaminate somebody else. And even, even in those operations, the contractors are mere, you know, it's a complete fraud. They're, they're pushing uh, contaminated soil into rivers. Um, they're scraping up large areas of land, putting it in big piles, and covering it over with plastic, and that's it. That's the future. They're looking, you know, the Japanese government is, is trying to persuade the people to share the burden, is how it's called. You know, take, take some of the contamination so they don't have it all. It's not going well for that plan. So we have this one recommendation, it's a big concern right now, is that the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the nuclear industry are hell-bent to continue the operation of these antiquated, flawed, aging GEBWRs. These are cash cows. But there's, there is a, there's a conflict right now uh, between the regulator and the industry. The recommendation of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission um, is, um, well, first of all, I should say that we, ha we have an order that's been issued. The order was issued on March 12, 2012 to all operators of Mark I and Mark II reactors. So it applies to Columbia. The order is that the operators at Columbia are to begin a set of, of, uh, of changes and retrofits and upgrades to have a reliable vent. So the, the vents that were, that were requested to be voluntarily installed on all Mark I's has now been extended to the Mark II's. So Columbia is now being asked only by order to put a, put a vent in. Uh, you know, this is, this is a, a bit of an upgrade over the, the Mark I, but again, it's too small. The containment is not serviceable. The order that's in place is to put in these upgrades that would provide management strategies for Columbia to prevent fuel damage, okay? So longer fire hoses, um, you know, more mobile diesel generators, um, more access to different kinds of cooling water, pumper trucks, you know, bring more water in, prevent the core damage. This is the order. The order as it's written expressly states this does not apply to any service post fuel damage. So the order that's in place right now, which Columbia is to comply with by December 31st, 
2016, it's two more fuel cycles, does not service the reactor for a meltdown. To me, that is Fukushima lessons unlearned. And again, it is a, a priority, a bias that promotes a production agenda over public safety. Now, the staff of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, I mean, we were just all over this. You're, you're, you're ordering compliance for changes that don't address core damage? And they say, wait a minute, wait, 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 don't, you know, look, I'm a nice guy. We're going to look at the post-fuel damage event, but not in this order. We're going to take that up in another set of regulations, in another set of recommendations. And so in November uh, 2012, the staff introduced <clears throat> a draft order. And the draft order is to, uh, it, it, basically what it presents is four options. Option one is to do nothing more than follow the March 2012 order for servicing containment vents pre-fuel damage, excluding post-fuel damage, option one. So basically that means do no more. Option two was, is to install what they call a severe accident capable vent on all Mark I, Mark II, which means that it would upgrade the venting system on the current Mark I to include evaluations and changes and modifications that would take into consideration the consequences of fuel damage namely high temperature, high pressure, and hydrogen gas. But option two provides no service for radiation. So as one NRC operator has called it, those 300 foot stacks would become fire hoses of radioactivity where they would vent the heat, the temperature, the hydrogen gas, but in the process, they would also be venting uh, radioactive particulate, um, you know, fuel damage. Option three would be a severe accident capable vent with a high capacity filter in this vent line so that you would essentially capture the um, uh, all of the, um, the particulate, but you would capture none of the Nobel gas. That would, you can't filter that stuff out. So that means radioactive krypton, radioactive xenon would escape as a gas, and then as a decay product, within a matter of seconds and minutes, it would rain out radioactive particulate of strontium-90 and cesium-137. So it's a, the decay chain in those Nobel gas uh, is, um, is particulate. But it would filter out a good bit of it uh, if, if they have this filter in. Uh, this is what is, what has been installed in a Swiss boiling water reactor since Chernobyl. The all, basically all the European reactors have put in these fil filtration systems for filtering containment uh, so that the operators have the option in good conscience they can say that they have preserved at least the principle 
of containment integrity, uh, which is to keep the radiation in by putting a filter. They're, they're venting it, they're defeating containment, but because they have a filtration system, at least they have some mindful attention to trying to keep the radiation and, and to keep the, the concept of, of, uh, of, uh, of containment. So these are, these are routinely installed, but it basically provides uh, you know, it gives the operator confidence that they can vent containment and not contaminate wholesale communities, massive land contamination, uh, but, but, uh, but not overpressurize the, um, uh, the, the containment. What we now see in terms of this whole concept of nuclear regulatory capture is that Within, you, will, you are now part, with, you, with this awareness, you are now witness that the staff of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has made recommendations to backfit Mark I, Mark II reactors with filters on high capacity, on these, on these uh, uh, hardened vent systems. And the industry is coming out wholesale against it. And they are joined by their champions on Capitol Hill. So the House Energy and Commerce Committee, um, 20 of the Republican members came out and said, no filters, not cost beneficial. Public safety is only benefited in the, in the most marginal insignificant way by putting a filter on, on this, this new vent. Uh, the Nuclear Energy Institute, chiefly the, the lobby group on Capitol Hill for the nuclear industry, has come out against the, uh, the filters. And um, the cost is going to be somewhere, it's difficult because they don't even have this uh, out to vendors yet anywhere from 16 to 24 million for the Mark I. For the Mark II, there's a problem, even for the filtered vent system, because the NRC has identified that the Mark II, like Columbia, is more vulnerable than the others to what they call containment bypass where in the event of a core damage event that, you know, when you would want to use the filter most of the inventing operation, in fact, there's a fly in the ointment for Columbia and the other seven because if the core goes ex vessel, if it goes through the, uh, the, the bottom of the vessel, there are penetrations that the Mark II is going to be vulnerable uh, to bypass containment. So a, filter, a filtered vent coming off the um, containment uh, is very likely to be bypassed. So it'll still get into the reactor building uh, and, and eventually work its way out into the environment. So the Mark II is still on the drawing board. So they don't really have a fix yet in mind, although they think that it's plausible. But it's not as clear cut as with that Mark I filtered venting system. So we're keeping our eye on, on the Mark II in that it has not been vetted to have a uh, venting system that uh, has uh, any reliability and and so um, but the industry and it, it has still come out against that and uh, I just wanted to end our comments here by the fact that you in this community are in a very unique situation because you have one of these very dangerous reactors co-located on the Hanford Nuclear Reservation uh, you have uh, you know, millions of 
gallons of uh, nuclear waste um, in these 177 tanks uh, around the, uh, the farm that are tentatively in stable condition. And, and it's a tenuous situation where you now have a vulnerable reactor co-located with this nuclear reserve. You know, these tanks were originally to service, in 19, as built in 1940s to service 20 years. And um, they're, you know, they're leaking. They're, some of the tanks are leaking in the vicinity of the reactor. Uh, there are large contamination plumes moving under the Columbia Nuclear Generating Station. And so there is this, this threat of, that was never really evaluated in the license renewal for the Columbia Nuclear Generating Station. So they never really looked at the problem of how these uh, these two threats conjoined to perhaps to be a much larger threat. And I, you know, I just, I just uh, close on this note that um, we've seen this before um, many, many years ago in, uh, in Kashtim in, in 1957 where um, the Mayak site in, was the, the plutonium production center for the Russian nuclear weapons industry. And it was principally a, uh, the sister project of Hanford. And, and this is what we have now, is, uh, is a compounding of, of this nuclear threat. Which brings me to the end of our talk, that we're, um, we are faced with a growing, dirty, dangerous, and expensive threat, but we have a growing alliance of activists, now governments, with Germany, phasing out nuclear power, Japan mobilizing to keep its nuclear power shut down. And so we're not alone in this, in this active effort for a 21st century energy policy in renewables efficiency and conservation. So thank you.